that you're related to because in the long run that will help your genes too. And we even see it more drastically in human societies with close communities like the Amish, the Mennonites, uh, Ashkenazi Jews in Europe. Basically these are groups where intermarriage outside of the community is strongly, strongly uh, acted against. They have very strict sets of requirements in terms of clothing and other factors that separate them from everyone around them to make it very clear who belongs and who doesn't. And again, this is, this is I mean, I don't want to, you know, it's not the same as a troop of chimpanzees, but it's the same basic idea that these people are isolating themselves from everyone around them to make sure that they know who belongs to their group and who doesn't. And by doing so, they've made sure that when their children grow up, they will tend to stick with other people in their grouping in the hopes of maintaining whatever it is about that group that they find desirable. And mate behavior, we see a lot of the same kinds of things. There's a, a, a famous Israeli biologist by the name of Ahmad Zahabi that developed an idea called the handicap principle, which just deals with how you signal to other members of your species. And normally this applies to mating. The handicap principle just says that whatever you're using as a signal needs to be expensive. And the idea being that if it's expensive, you can't fake it. And so the big head on this male bat is expensive to produce all of the, the bone and, and tissue that goes with it. The bright blue feathers of the peacock is expensive to produce, partly because of the fact that it's a lot of blue pigments are very expensive to make anyway, but also because this tail is so big it hampers the male's ability to get away from predators. So it's expensive in terms of how likely you are to survive when something comes to get you. And so the question becomes, does this sort of thing apply to human signaling? And I would argue that it does. Um, it's not bright blue, but otherwise you've got a car with a huge tail on it. Um, the idea here, and I had a, a professor at uh, Ohio State who talked about this. The guy who can afford to do this to his car is saying two things. One, look at me, because I've got this crazy psycho car that no normal person would have. But two, he's saying, I can afford to wreck this car to the point where it's almost not usable because it doesn't matter to me, I can replace it with one if I need to. He's basically saying, I can pay this cost, and it won't matter much to me because I can replace it when I need to. The same idea of buying, you know, your $100,000 Rolex watches and things like that that are basically a chunk of gold strapped to your wrist. These are expensive signals that say, I can afford this because if it gets wrecked, I can replace it. Someone who has a really expensive watch and who never lets anybody touch it or see it, that person is saying, I can't replace it. That sends a very different signal. And now you, the question becomes, do people respond to that? I would argue that when you see people like this with the Pimp My Ride shirts and all this other stuff, that clearly these things do have signals that may be affecting how others respond to them. When you see the guy with the crazy car driving somewhere and all these people swarm around it, there's a sign that people are paying attention to the signal, whether it's being interpreted the way he wants or not. I don't think most of the guys get this sort of attention, but you never know. <laughs> there's also the aspect of which kind of ties into the last thing about female <laughs> choice, which is basically just, yeah, I don't know if you can read this, it says, it says cut the crap and show us your willy. Um, but basically the idea is that in many species, the male has to do something really, really crazy to attract the attention of the females. And it's up to the females to pick what's going to be useful. And so it's arbitrary in that, in the case of the peacock, they like the big, you know, crazy tail. In the case of those bats, they like the male with the big, funky snout. It varies a lot from one species to another. Maybe in human beings they do like the car with the big tail, it's hard to say. <laughs> but the idea is that males oftentimes behave in ways that seem silly because they have to do what they have to do to get female attention. Because the male that doesn't do what the females want never reproduces. If he never reproduces, his genes don't pass on, so he's not going to be successful. What did you do to get catty? <laughs> I'm still not sure. I'm still not sure about that, actually. My sister worked on her a lot, so I got my sister acting to help out with that. And the same thing applies with human beings. Uh, ladies' night, which every now and then you'll hear that there's some guy who's suing a bar because the ladies' night is unfair, it's not fair that women get in free, and yada, 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 whatever. But the point of ladies' night is that the bar knows that if you have women there, the men will come there, too, because that's where the women are. Guys don't go out to bars very often just to hang out by themselves. They want there to be women there too. So again, this is a way of saying, I need to go where women are. If I'm going to have any chance of attracting them, I've got to be in the place that they're at. So ladies' night, which has been around for a while, obviously, I don't think you see signs like this anymore with the weekly swing dance uh, <laughs> advertisements. But 
the idea is the same thing, that if you want to attract a large crowd, attract the women and the men will follow because they don't have much choice in the matter. And this also goes to behavior in terms of what happens at those bars. The, the fancy term for this is coupledry, which is when one mate in a pair cheats on the other and has offspring that are produced by another parent. And this is showing that this is a male who's taking care of an offspring that's not his own because his female had an extra pair copulation, as they call it, uh, to produce offspring that are not his. And this is something that animals do a lot to prevent. This male bird, what he normally does is follow his female mate around whenever she leaves the nest until the eggs are laid to make sure she's not mating with someone else. And if another male intrudes on his territory, he's going to fly over and try to beat the snot out of him. Which I would argue is no different than what you see anytime you go to a bar. Whenever some guy sits down next to somebody's girlfriend, and the next thing you know there's a fight. Um, I was talking to a, a student of mine who was a fireman who said they got called to a bar four times in one night. Oh no, it was, it was yeah, sorry, Eddie, a guy at a bar. Four times in one night they had fights, and I'm willing to bet you that at least two of those got started because somebody spoke to someone else's girlfriend or gave the look or whatever to start that. Because it's almost always over access to females, and this goes back, you know, as long as human history's been around. This is a painting that shows, um, I can't remember, this is the infidelity, I believe, is the, 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 the female, the woman, and she, the, the symbol of couple dream that you had been cheated on, you, you, you had horns on your head. And so I like this picture because the infidelity is going around this French court putting horns on everybody's head. But I also like this particular vision where not only does she have horns on her head, but she's pointing to one to point to her husband that, yes, I know you cheated on me. Something which goes on quite a bit. But there's a lot going on in human societies to try and prevent this, just like there is in animal societies. Whether it was very strict rules, as we find in Islam, about, you know, an unmarried female cannot go off with other males without being escorted by a family member. And you know, the ideas of, you know, not coveting your neighbor's wife and things like that. These are just ideas to prevent the possibility that you might be raising some kids that aren't yours. You know, the, the paternity test, the baby daddy thing, you know, Jerry Springer, all of that is basically <laughs> nothing more than outgrowths of behavior that have been around as long as there have been paired matings in the animal kingdom. And so we're not doing anything differently with our behavior than what other animals do. And it's, it's if you go out and do... You know, paternity tests, they used to, there was a time they were going to randomly paternity test that I learned about. It was in New Jersey. My history teacher told me about it. It was back in the 50s. They were going to do testing of blood types back then. It was all it would have been. But they, they stopped very quickly because they realized that a significant proportion of the children who were being born could not have had the father they thought they did. And so they realized it was going to cause a great big scandal, so they stopped doing it. Because they, they were just blood typing the babies for health reasons, but they realized you could figure out the paternity was not correct in many of those cases. And genetically speaking, nowadays we do it even more precisely, and that's where the whole Jerry Springer, Maury Povich, baby daddy episodes that come up once a month during well, sweeps. More than that. Well, whenever sweeps is on, it was the whole week. But that's the whole idea, that you don't want to waste energy raising kids that aren't yours, but for the other member of the mating pair, it might be worthwhile to sneak off and try to get some extra kids. Whether you're the female or the male, you know, cheating is a way to increase your fitness because you get more offspring as a result of it. And so it's something that we have a lot of things set up to fight because females getting to make the choices means they're more likely to be the ones who are able to cheat, and so the males are a lot more worked up about it in most cases. There's also a lot of other sorts of behaviors that kind of go along with that we find in other animals, the same as in human beings. Outbreeding, or what we more commonly refer to as avoiding incest, just means you don't mate with your relative, which to us seems like a no-brainer. But it's actually programmed into our genes to not do that. If you raise kids together, and uh, this happened in uh, the kibbutzes in Israel, they raised the kids together and basically acted as if they were all a family. The idea they thought was if you raise all these kids together, they'll get to know each other, and they will then marry within that and keep the group cohesive. It turns out they almost never would marry one another because they were, they, if you're raised with individuals who are children at your same age, that's usually your relatives. And so you don't want to mate with them because that would be incest, and there's all sorts of genetic reasons why incest is bad. So it's not, even though they weren't related, even though they knew they weren't related, there still was this deep aversion to that process based on genetic cues that are built into us, to all of us, animals, and all, all animals and humans, to avoid that. An interesting question that comes up, this came up in my evolution class when I was an undergrad, uh, the professor talked about a specific example of a male fish that mates where the male basically attaches to the female and gets absorbed into her body and basically becomes a little tiny 
pit bull that produces sperm 